Happy Easter. Happy Easter. See, y'all are getting better at this every week. If you weren't here last week and you think he is clearly unaware of what the calendar says, um, we are doing something different for us this year, but in the way of the church, not new. It's called Easter Tide. You know, some things are hard to learn well and right the first time. They take time to soak into us. And I think the resurrection of Jesus from the dead is one of those things. The sheer mystery and power that, that surround the resurrection mean we need time to receive it. And so the church has, in its wisdom, decided to take the weeks after Easter to live into that power, to let the power of the resurrection, like a fresh tide, wash over us and make us fresh and new. That's what we're trying to do. So we're going to follow the experience that the early church had that first Easter, following Jesus in his resurrection appearances to his disciples. Last week we stood with Mary Magdalene at the garden tomb. Next week we'll be with Simon Peter on the Sea of Galilee there at the shore. This week we're going to spend our time with two disciples that you've not heard of before and won't hear, of, hear from again as they're making their way home to a place called Emmaus. If you have a copy of the scripture, it's in the 24th chapter of Luke's gospel, beginning in the 13th verse. The gospel according to Luke, chapter 24, beginning in verse 13. And if you have a copy of the scripture, if you would open it there with us, it is there that the scripture says. Now that same day, two of them, were traveling to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking to each other about all of the things that had happened, and while they were discussing these and talking with each other, Jesus himself came upon them and began to walk with them. But they were prevented from recognizing him. And Jesus asked them, What are you discussing together as you walk along? And they stood still, their heads hung in dismay. And one of them, called Cleopas, said, Are you a visitor to Jerusalem? Do you not know the things that are happening these days? What things? Jesus asked. And they replied, About Jesus of Nazareth. He was a great prophet, mighty in word and deed before God and the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over for the death sentence. And they crucified him. But we had hoped that he would be the one who would redeem Israel. What's more, it's been three days since these things happened. And in addition, some of our women astounded us this morning. Early, they went to the tomb, but they could not find his body. And they came back and they told us of a vision of angels who told them that he had been raised from the dead. And some of our companions went to the tomb and found it exactly the way the women described, but him they did not see. And Jesus said to them, How foolish you are. How slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Must not the Christ suffer all these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he began to explain to them all of the things in Scripture concerning himself. And when they reached the village where they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going farther. But they urged him, saying, It's the evening time and the day is nearly over. Stay with us here. So he stayed with them and came in. And while they were at table, Jesus took the bread and gave thanks and broke it and began to distribute it to them. And their eyes were opened. And they recognized that it was Jesus, and immediately he disappeared from their sight. And they said to one another, Were not our hearts burning within us as he walked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? And immediately they got up and in that very hour returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven and all those who were with them together. And they were saying, it's true, the Lord has been raised and he's appeared to Simon. And these two explained all of the things that happened on the road and how Jesus was recognized when he broke the bread. This is the word of the Lord. Can you get into their experience this morning? 
Can you put yourself in the place of these disciples on the way to Emmaus? It was only a week earlier that they had come to Jerusalem for the Passover in this great moment of celebration. And they were with the crowd, perhaps, calling out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And here they are only a week later. And everything has changed. Now they're walking into the sunset, literally. They think their best days are behind them. They think that God's grace has passed them by. They feel forsaken and abandoned by God. And they wonder how they could possibly have been so wrong about Jesus, about who he was, about what the things that he said actually meant about where he was leading them, about whether he was going to bring the kingdom and that with power, about why he had come, about how the Messiah was to minister. And as they're walking and discussing these things together, a stranger joins them. They don't recognize him, but he listens to them. He asks them questions. Why were you in Jerusalem? Don't you know? How could anyone not know? that Jesus is dead, that evil has triumphed over good, that death has won over life, that life now has no meaning and everything is lost. And yet in their despair, still they listen to him. And this one who seemed to not know the events of the week began explaining the way of the world, beginning with Moses and all the prophets. He opened to them the scripture and explained all things concerning himself. And they began to see how the story really was supposed to work. Maybe for the first time in their lives they were discovering the difference between simply reading the Bible and spending time with its author. Because the the text of the scripture is supposed to point us to its author. And if we will pray and ask the Holy Spirit that he will draw us to the Father and the Son and the Spirit and we will come to know what John Wesley used to call the strangely warm call of Christ in our lives. And then almost too soon it seemed to them, I suspect, they found themselves at the house and here they are in Emmaus and it's nearly dusk and the stranger says, well, I've got to be going on. And isn't that just like Jesus? To not force himself on anyone, but to give us the chance to make a choice. And they made one. They invited him to come into their house, and they shared their house and their hospitality and their table. And it was then and there that they recognized Jesus among them. The same Jesus who's been there all along. It was then that they realized that their hearts had been burning within them all day long, though there had been no mention of it during the day. It was there when he broke the bread that their eyes were opened. Why there? Brady Knight used to ask, maybe it was in this motion that for the first time they saw his hands and his wrists and the nail scars. Maybe it was something about the language at table that harkened back to something they had heard him say, like when he called Mary Magdalene's name at the tomb, and she knew. Their eyes were open. And no sooner had they recognized him at the table than Jesus was gone. And suddenly, these two, who had slowly and hopelessly made that long, arduous journey of seven miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus, joyfully, gladly, quickly ran back to town. The Bible says literally, and they returned to Jerusalem in that very hour. Took them all day to make that seven mile trek there. They made the whole way back in an hour. That's an eight and a half minute pace over uneven terrain, which is pretty good in flip flops and skirts. (laughs) Something radical has changed in their lives. And it happened when they invited Jesus into their home happens for us that way. When we invite Jesus to be a guest at our table, when we invite Jesus to be part of our family, when we invite the people in our lives into the circle of our care and invite them to table at Jesus with Jesus, when we share the love of God with people that we love, we discover the presence of Christ 
in our midst. Part of what Luke wants us to get here, a key to our faith, and hear this before you go off to college, would you please? Until you invite Jesus in your house, he won't be real in your life. Which means when you go off someplace and you have to start a new pattern for your living, it's not just that we want you to find a church home, though we want you to do that. It's that we want you to have Jesus in your home, in your dorm room, in some crazy place, in Russia, wherever that's going to be. The language will be the same. It's not until you invite Jesus into your house that he becomes real. It wasn't the unleavened bread of the Passover, it was the common bread of their home where they discovered Jesus because when we take the things that are ours and we offer them to Jesus, when we take the moments that are ours and we offer them to Jesus, they become holy. The truth is, it's not the bread of the table, it's the bread of life that matters. And this incredible mystery that is Easter and the resurrection says that Jesus' presence at his table makes each of us and all of us first-hand witnesses to the resurrection. That's what Luke wants us to see. This really is our story, too. Is it your story? You find yourself walking in life through the slow and sad dismay that comes when our experience, faith, and hope collide. And this isn't how we thought things were supposed to go, and it wasn't thought where I thought we were supposed to be, and these aren't the things that we thought we'd be doing, and it makes no sense. And in our confusion, we open ourselves to someone hoping they can help, not sure if they can. And we begin to live life together. And we make this discovery that in the Bible, who knew? In the Bible, you can find the deep secrets to life and the truth that is behind all things and suddenly in this nexus of intimacy with our fellow travelers and urgency in our study of the scripture we discover it really is Jesus himself who's present to us warming our hearts with his truth and his grace and his love showing us himself as the bread is broken that's our story that is the truth that we hold and the truth that holds us in the face of everything that's wrong in the world out there. That is the truth that we hold and the truth that holds us in the face of all the things that are wrong in the church. and All the things that are wrong inside of us. Luke tells this story in such a way that he invites us to let it become our story. We're invited to let our hearts burn as we study the Scripture. Because the careful study of Scripture is supposed to bring together head and heart, theoria and praxis, our intellect and our emotion. You see, it's only when we understand that the climax of the Old Testament is the person of Jesus that we can really understand what the Old Testament says. And it's only when we understand that Jesus is the person to whom all of the Scripture points that we can really understand who he is. And it's only when we invite this living Jesus into the intimacy of our everyday lives that we discover that he's been with us all along. Look in Luke 24 and ask yourself, are you clinging to Good Friday? If you are, hear the good news, according to Cleopas, lay it down. Let the weight go. The weight is over. Jesus has been raised from the dead. He is risen. He is here present among us. He is with us today. And the church is supposed to be the place where we bring in our Good Fridays and we trade them for Easter Sunday. The church is supposed to be the place where we set aside the weight of the world for the lightness of God's glory and his light and his love. The church is supposed to be the place where we bring in our difficult questions and our despair and our confusion in the world and we're equipped with truth and grace and light and love. The church is the place where we amble in in confusion and sprint out with joy, equipped for the journey, filled with hope and carrying good news to share. So you're invited today. Bring your questions. 
you are invited today, bring your problems. Bring your agony. On the road to Emmaus with Cleopas and his companion, and if you will, be prepared to share your prayer with this stranger who will come and meet you along the way and listen to his voice. Listen to his voice as he invites a fresh reading of the scripture. Listen to his voice as he calls us forward into the work of the kingdom. Listen to his voice as he applies the scripture to the things that are happening in your life in this very moment. Because if you'll learn to live your life in this story, I think you'll find there is an inexhaustible resource, not only of wisdom and knowledge, but of God's presence and love to carry us through all of our days. Well, would you pray with me? Gracious God, help us to be brave enough and honest enough to share with you our questions and our frustrations and our disappointment and our confusion as we walk along the way in life. Help us to be brave enough, wise enough, patient enough to look into the Scripture, to see how all the things point to you, and to look to the resurrection and to see your victory that offers us life and peace and joy and love and purpose and hope. Help us, O oh God, to live into the resurrection that we might walk with Jesus. For it is in the strong and saving name of Jesus that we pray. And all God's people said, what about you? If you've never given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, how about today? To receive his grace and his power to come to know his presence in your life, to have a reliable guide on the journey you're walking. If you don't know the Lord Christ, we invite you, when the music begins, you just come to the front. And let's talk about how to begin that relationship. Or perhaps you're already a believer in Christ, but you don't have a church home, and you could transfer your membership here by transfer of your letter from another Baptist church on your statement of prior Christian faith. Do, do you catch the way these things happen in community? Jesus himself said, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Here were these companions on the road and Jesus was present to them. Solo faith is not the way we live. We live together. When the good news came to Cleopas and his companion, they ran to Jerusalem because there was a family to celebrate. There were people to commiserate. They were not alone. And you don't have to be either. Maybe you've been here a long time and it's been a hard season and you don't understand why things are happening the way they're happening and you can't find the answers you're looking for and you just need to offer that to God honestly and you need to invite him to come into the most intimate places of your life study the scripture sharing the table discover that Jesus is walking with you all the while If you need to make a public decision I invite you to come to the front can we all commit ourselves to Christ and to his kingdom as we stand together to sing
seated, please? If you're a guest with us for the first time or the 101st time, if you haven't already, would you please tear this card out and fill it out and put it in the offering plate when it comes by? Just let us know you were here. But we'd like to follow up with you and, and thank you for coming and share with you what we think God is doing in our midst. Hear what God is doing in your life or the search that you have to find whether God's in your life and what place you might have here in that journey. There's a place on the back of this card. It just says, please pray for me. And if you're walking and it feels like you're walking on your own through something and you need someone to pray with you, fill that out. If you don't specify more, if you just fill it out and put it in the offering plate, we'll add it to the Wednesday night prayer list, and everybody who comes this Wednesday night will pray for you. If you want it in a closer circle, if you write pastoral team or just the pastor, tomorrow when the ministers gather, we'll lift you up by name. Or if you just write pastor, I'll pray for you, and we won't divulge what you've asked us to pray for. That'll be held in confidence. For all of us who've made a commitment to Christ in this place, we make it complete when we share. When the good news that's come to us propels us out of our homes and up and down those rocky crags and back to the places where the believers are and back to the places where the people we love are so that we can share the gospel. When we share our faith with people that we know and love, inviting them into faith and into the church. When we share our gifts in mission and ministry when we share the resource of the earth that has been entrusted to us with each other so that together we can build up God's kingdom. Let's continue to worship as we share.